Ladies and gentlemen, chefs at home, the ingredients I have for you today are making the best meal you've ever had. If you're a DJ who wants to touch the international stage with versatility, with flair, and with class, you need to watch today's episode. Seated with me, we have the famous Akio, founder of Strictly Soul and a whole bunch of other projects which he's going to tell us about. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, thank you so much for having me. Recipe for success. I love that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're going to give them the ingredients today. You excited? I mean, I'll tell them what I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, all, that's yeah. all they need. That's all they need. How are you doing today? Solid, solid, yeah. yeah. A little bit tired. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Just got back in the country from Tanzania. Um, but good, man. We keep it moving. And we're definitely we going to tell yeah. them about that. All the movement Absolutely. and everything you've got going on. But before that, let's start mm. with a bit of an icebreaker. Loosen Word. the muscles, loosen the bones. Okay. Let's talk five DJs that inspire you. I'm giving you Coachella. I say, Akio, please run Coachella for me and give me a lineup of the best. Ooh, that's a tough one. Okay, I would say first, um, maybe Jazzy Jeff. Okay. Um, you know, as a DJ, like just over the span of generations, like that dude's been around for so long. Mm, mm. Uh, he's done so much with his mixtapes. Um, and just the versatility, the stuff he's done with Serato, like he just he's just a music guy, you know. Mm, mm. And what I like about him is he was someone that was never like a, a big personality guy. He was yeah, just a guy who delivered yeah, on the yeah. music. Like yeah. even if you look at like his appearances on Fresh Prince, you know, he wasn't even like Will Smith was like the personality. Jazzy Jeff was like the music guy. So mm. I would say um, Jazzy Jeff. And then I would say like locally, um, there's a guy named DJ Rako okay. who um, was with me when I was doing Cool Out. He really helped to um, kind of, I learned a lot from him. You know, I think mm. anytime you're doing something, when I first started DJing, uh, it was just me and a homeboy and we we're at the same level. We yeah, were just yeah, both yeah. learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our learning curve was was slow because we didn't have anybody to teach us. You know what I'm saying? 100%. And this was like way back. I don't even know if YouTube existed then. So we used to have like DVDs okay. of like how to DJ. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had to learn from that. Uh, so when I started doing Cool Out in Cape Town 2000. I think he came on board like 2009, 2010. Yeah. Like having such a high level DJ, like I learned so much uh, from him. Uh, I'd say DJ Moma from Everyday People. Uh, mm -hmm. Also just learned a lot from him in terms of like uh, versatility, also like the business, uh, understanding like the crowds. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I say that there's like good DJs, there's yeah, very yeah, good yeah. DJs yeah. and great DJs. And the difference is, is very, very good DJs will deliver 99 percent of the time yeah yeah but they might miss every once in a while yeah, with the crowd yeah, yeah. great djs never miss mm. you know what i'm saying and with him I, i've never seen him miss um what's that three um then i would say p cutter he's another guy that i work with yeah also just a very talented dj um also in the same line with reiko uh learned a lot from him of course. um and just also understands music mm. and then let me pick another local guy i've been working a lot with venom let me put venom on yeah, there yeah, also yeah. guy who knows who knows his hip-hop knows his r&b can play on a piano if he needs to play i like versatile guys yeah you know yeah, so let yeah. me let me pick those five i think that's a fire lineup yeah. let's get tickets for that first no doubt for sure for sure so we made you a dish that i think represents your heritage um, yeah. And we're going to pair it with a nice tequila infused paloma. I, I've never had paloma in my life, so okay. I hope this is how it's supposed to taste. The producers have cooked it, so I hope it, it tastes good. Um, how is katsudon, which is a dish we have yes. supposed to be served? Is it something we eat with our hands? No, Are so it's uh, something you uh, eat with chopsticks. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and okay. it can be like a, a, a lunch dish or a, a dinner dish. So okay. it's a very like typical Japanese yeah, um, yeah. meal. So for me, it's one of my favorite meals. So what I really like about it is... Um, um, you know, from a, a breading point of view, like mm. panko breadcrumbs are like, to me, that's like the highest level of like um, breading. Mm. And then the way that it's done with the egg omelet. So it yeah. uses like the mirin, which is like a, a bit of a sweet vinegar. Yeah. So you get like a bit of a, um, a sweet taste yeah. as well. And then you get your caramelized onions and then like the the, 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 the pork or the chicken uh, cutlet breaded yeah. in, in panko with the rice on the bottom. So you kind of get in everything. So... Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite dishes. A hundred percent. And we're going to speak to that right now and when they bring us the dish. But I want to jump into mm. birth, right? Word. What is the household looking like? What type of family are you born into? Um, how was that dynamic growing up? 
Uh, so both my parents are immigrants. Uh, my father is from Japan. My mother's from the Netherlands. Uh, they both moved to the United States uh, in their 20s. Okay. Um, my father came there uh, to study. My mom was working in Washington, D.C., and then they met while my father was in university uh, in Maryland, and then they moved down to Tennessee, which is where I was born. So I was born oh, in a okay. small town uh, in Tennessee. Okay. Um, and yeah, you know, I was like one of the few Asian kids, uh, I think in my school or in my grade, there was two other kids. There was a South Korean kid mm -hmm. and a Filipino kid. So we kind of ran together uh, as a little crew. Um, and I guess from a cooking standpoint, uh, growing up, my father was the cook. Yeah, um, yeah. Because so during that time, uh, there was a Toyota factory uh, in another city. Okay. So there were like there was a group of Japanese people that were there kind of working. So there was a small Japanese grocery store, mm -hmm. but there were no Japanese restaurants back then. You couldn't even get sushi. Sushi was like not even a thing back then. Okay. So um, my father, if he loves Japanese food, obviously that's what he grew up on. So if he wanted Japanese food. He had to make it himself. Yeah, yeah. You know? So growing up, he did all the cooking in the household. And my mom, no disrespect, can't cook. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She can't. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, she's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, typical, like, white mom, like, yeah, cooking, yeah. doesn't season anything. Like, <laughs> my pops, like, knows what's up, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. So, um, damn, sorry, moms. <laughs> it's true. So yeah, growing up, like it was always like my mom had like two dishes that were acceptable. Yeah. But outside of that, my pops did all the cooking. Yeah, he ran the kitchen. Yeah, he ran the kitchen. He, he loved down. cooking. And you know, I look at like a lot of things in terms of like what I'm doing now. He's a uh, he's a teacher. Mm. So that's why we ended up in this small town. Because mm. uh, he was teaching at a school there. And he, uh, you know, he's an academic, but he always used to throw parties at the cribs so we always had like a karaoke yeah, machine yeah, yeah. Uh, he had every type of karaoke machine like that existed he had the eight track he had the tape deck he had the um um laser disc y'all mm. don't even know laser disc man like nobody had laser disc we had laser disc he had um mini disc players all the different types of karaoke machines going yeah, up so he would yeah. uh he would invite people from the university uh like people in the faculty other students exchange students he was like a big uh influence for um all the asian exchange students so he oh. headed the asian exchange program so he kind of was like a mentor for all the asian students studying there uh so he'd have parties at the cribs and he would just cook oh, i remember he'd cook so much stuff so uh, the whole living room would be filled with food. Yeah. And then uh, he would just play music. Everybody would come over. He'd be killing it on the karaoke machine. Like, my pops could sing. Yeah. Like, me, my brother, um, the voice, like, singing. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, missed yeah. us. Yeah. But um, but he could sing. And uh, he would kill it on the karaoke machine. He'd have the parties. And me, you know, me and my brother, we would just run. We'd be kids, and we'd just be running around the parties. Mm, mm. So um, I think that, you know, now I look back on kind of my... Um, my growth, like, you know, uh, my career arc. And I'm like, you know, I also started off um, going to university, then getting a master's degree, like going down that path of academia as well. Yeah. And then at some point, like I ended up doing like the things that my pops was doing but yeah. for fun. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just like, damn, you know, I love cooking and hosting dinners. Damn, I love throwing parties. Like, yeah. that's what I do now, you know? So I think, you know, um, subconsciously that really you know, impacted kind of what yeah, I'm doing. Yeah, 100%. That was the, the foundation for, yeah. for for what you are and the events that you create now. Um, so I'm just going to get them to bring the food through. And in the meantime, though, I failed, I think I failed geography in like grade four or something like that. So okay. my geography isn't that great. Um, but if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Tennessee's in Texas. No, it's no? in the south. It's so in Tennessee the south. is its own, yeah, its own state. Okay. So Texas is uh, about three states over. That's like southwest. We're southeast. So what, like what we call ourselves is the dirty south. Okay. So that's like uh, Tennessee, Georgia. So like Memphis, uh, Atlanta, um, like even down to like Louisiana. Uh, that's like dirty south. Okay, yeah. but but in general, there's this idea, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure it is the truth, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of how the South is, right. right, from a discrimination perspective. No doubt. Um, and in general, the U.S., when we speak about immigrants now, specifically with um, Mexican immigrants, there's mm. huge problems with discrimination there. For sure. Now you are a full immigrant, right? Yeah. Um, and what makes it worse, perhaps, is that you are of Asian descent, and right. we know the Asian sentiment that exists within mm. the U.S. So what does that mean growing up? Are you being bullied at school? Are you feeling left out? Because you say you even choose then to associate with 
other Asian kids? Is that as a result of the kind of ecosystem that exists within that state? So, you know, definitely in the South, a lot of racism, uh, you know, and it varies. Um, Mm -hmm. The smaller the town, the more racist it is. Oh. You know, so the cities are generally a little bit more liberal, a little bit more diverse. So for me growing up, you know, also I'm a little bit older. So I was, uh, the generation I grew up in, there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment. So during that time, uh, Japan was seen as like a big rival um, to the U.S. as from an economic standpoint. Um, they, they didn't like the fact like there was a big uh, rivalry between like Japanese cars and U.S. cars. Mm. Um, I, I can get into the whole like trade wars that were yes, going on, yes, but Japan yes, was getting yes, like a yes. lot of uh, uh, bad publicity at the time, almost in the same way that it's like China and U.S. Mm. are now battling now. Back then it was Japan. And then in addition to that, you had like all the old folks, like the 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 60 plus year olds Mm -hmm. were still pissed off about like World War II and Pearl Harbor. And then you had the people that were in their 30s and 40s who just didn't like Asian people because of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I remember like the first time, like, I mean, there was, you know, there was racist stuff that I dealt with as 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 a kid, but that's a different type of racism. Racism from kid to kid is, is different. It's ignorance. You know what I'm saying? Like they just really don't know any better you know it it hurts but it's different Mm. so but i remember like one of the first times i really had like racism from um from an adult as a kid Mm -hmm. and that's different because then Mm. you're just like yo Mm. so i remember i was like at a gas station at a a garage and i was Mm. just getting some like snacks or whatever and this this guy came up to me he must have been his 40s he looked like i don't know i in my mind i've always said he's like a vietnam vet i don't know if he is Mm -hmm. so he came up to me and he's like yo uh, you know where are you from are you vietnamese and I'm like, no, he's like, are you, are you a Laotian? Mm. No, I'm like, uh, and I must've been like maybe nine or 10 at that mm-hmm, time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so he's like, what, what are you? And I said, I'm Japanese. And he's like, oh, like fucking Pearl Harbor. Da, da, da. Mm. And he like spits at me and like threatens me and some shit. And I'm just like, I'm like, damn, like, you know, mm. like, I, was, I was struggling to comprehend yeah, it yeah, at yeah. that time. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. There've been like other subtle things, yeah, but, but that but was like the first time I'd like right. felt threatened mm. by like an adult you know as a child so that's like a story i didn't even tell my parents about because also like one my mom wouldn't understood it because she's white and my, my and I, with my father i never bothered him with like things like this growing up you know he's like a japanese father is very much almost like a traditional african father mm. you know what i'm saying they the breadwinner they focused on your academics they focused on your sports they weren't really um emotionally you know what i'm saying that they weren't like a uh someone you could talk to about yeah, things yeah, like yeah, that yeah, yeah. you know what i'm saying yeah. so i just kind of held that one in the only person who really saw it was my homeboy who uh lived up the street from me who's like my best friend he, he walked out of the uh the the convenience store at the time was just like you know what was going on you know so i'd say um there was that and also just like from a from a racial point of view at that point we didn't even have mexicans in tennessee at that point mm. so it was either uh the white kids or the black kids that was it there was not there was nothing else there was nothing in between so as i got older the mexicans kind of started coming in which added a little bit of diversity but also at the same time like messed up perceptions of white people and me because then they started thinking i was mexican so yeah <laughs> Yeah, and it also depends. Like when I'm in LA, for example, there's a lot of mixed race Asian kids there, but there's a lot of people that think I'm Mexican. So, you know, it was um, that was like an interesting dynamic growing up. So for me, I kind of had to figure out where, um, what lane I was going to be in. Where did I find identity? You know. So for me, the two things that I found identity in was uh, music and basketball. So me and my brother both both play basketball. Um, So that was kind of who I was through through uh, elementary school, middle mm-hmm. school, and into mm-hmm. high school. Was like I was one of the basketball players, you know. So I was playing travel teams, and also what that did was that put me in a mostly black environment. So then that also kind of shaped where I was at musically. But I was, you know, I grew yeah. up in the '90s and stuff. So um, that was, you know, for a lot of people, they consider the golden era of hip hop. So I was like super young when hip hop like broke broke through. So I remember our neighbors having like the refrigerator box out and break dancing mm. and like just from a very, I saw hip hop from a, the early inception, mm. you know, Infancy. yeah, Infancy. Gr- growing up. So I was kind of there through it all. So, you know, basketball and hip hop kind of helped shape my identity uh, and also like the communities that, w- that I was in mm. uh, and kind of gave me purpose, you know, until I got to, to university. And then at that point I kind of started, uh, then I went to Japan mm-hmm. and then I got a little bit more knowledge of self. I mean, I lived there as a kid, but I wasn't there as an adult. So once I went to Japan after I graduated, well, at 19, and then after I graduated, that's when I understood myself. Uh, and you can't, like, 
you can't be confident in yourself mm. if you don't know who you are, mm. you know? So for me, uh, that was like the major step that, it's also where I started learning how to DJ, but that's kind of what, uh, living in Japan is what changed my path mm. in terms of going from like a shy kid to like being like a, a, a much more confident person, mm. you know? Mm. I think that's really interesting. So after that sort of first incident, and we're definitely going to speak more mm. to your experiences in Japan and how that all kind of played out for you. But after that first incident, was it something that frequently occurred after that? And did you then sort of build a bit of a tolerance mm. to it? So or? it would, yes and no. Uh, it, it did happen, but you know, then I, I was fortunate enough, to, uh, I went to a high school in Nashville, which is like the bigger city. So I was from a small town. And I got um, kind of like a basketball sh a scholarship to go mm. to a private school. Mm. So that really changed it. And the school that I went to was like really liberal and also pretty diverse. So when I went there, my last three years of high school was like um, a lot of peace, you know, from from that point of view. There were there were a couple incidents here and there. I remember I had a, a Korean friend, Joe Hong. He had to fuck up this white boy just because he was talking shit about us. Yeah, but like yeah, that yeah. was like a whole other story. Oh, yeah. that's a whole other story. Yeah. And then when I went to university, so at this point, I'm just trying to get out of Tennessee. Yeah. I'm just trying yeah. to get out of Tennessee. Yeah. So I'm just like, yeah, when I get to university, I can finally get out of here. Mm -hmm. Uh, so then it was time for me to go to university. I applied for schools. And I don't know what the process is here. Um, um, but, you know, in the state you apply to all your, all your universities across the U.S. And um, I got into a decent amount, but I was limited by what my parents could afford. So it came down to, like, a couple schools that gave me, like, a scholarship. Um, so the one school that was the most affordable for me, that was also a good academic school, uh, and I could play basketball, uh, was in Memphis, which is also in Tennessee. So mm. I'm just like, damn, I got to stay in Tennessee. So, but I went. Mm, mm. And the school I went to in Tennessee, like good academic school, but it was just all rich white kids. Like I remember uh, in the book, it's called the Princeton Review, and they tell you about all the schools, but they, 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 they talk about it in kind of a, a candid and funny way. It's mm. not super formal. And they talk about comments about the school that people write. And one of the comments that uh, was about that school was it's it's Rhodes College, so they're like, Rhodes College is really diverse. It's got every type of white kid. Okay. So, so so then I got there and I'm just like, damn, they they right, mm, you know. Mm. I was playing basketball. The only there was, I remember one Asian girl. She was Vietnamese, and then all the black kids were on the football team. Even the basketball team was all white, and oh. uh, yeah, and. Then there was a couple, like a couple incidents from the first, the first week, their orientation. I had to go check this guy who was like making fun of like me being Asian, was calling me Chinese and shit, but some other stuff. But I remember I had to go to his dorm room and there was almost a fight. And I remember that was the first two weeks of school. And it was during those two weeks, I'm like, I got to get up out of here, you know? So spent that first year at the university, uh, played basketball. And then after that, I went home for the summer and just applied to other universities to transfer. I was like, yo, I got to go. I got to get out of here. Got into a couple of the universities, but it was the same problem, man. You know, we couldn't afford to go. So the next year, so I'm like, damn, I got to go back. Mm. So I was like upset. I had to go back. Uh, and then it was in between that year that I went to Japan at 19. My father took me to Japan. Mm. And then when I went back, that I was also a, a different person. And when I went back to the school for my second year, now at age 19 or 20, that's when I was like, I don't care about fitting in and i think that that's one of the things when you're a minority especially when you're mixed race um when you you you're in the middle of different communities you know you you don't quite know where you are you know mm. what i'm saying and people a lot of times try to choose your identity for you mm. so you want to just fit in that's all you want to do is fit in and then when i went back uh my second year after japan my whole mentality had changed mm. i was like i don't want to fit in ever again yeah i'm never going to do anything that is done because everybody's doing it or to fit in. Everything that I'm going to do is going to be me and I'm actually going to just embrace being different. You know, I'm going to be known for being like my own thing. So like once I got back my second year, I got bigger into hip hop, like just all the things that I was doing just really kind of created me as a, a, a different type of individual. And mm -hmm. that in and of itself attracted its own community. And that's even how I operate today, which we can get into later mm. in terms of recipe for success and the way that I approach my business model. Uh, so 
I went back to second year, was focused on just being myself and being different. And then I was when I was walking to like the, the university cafeteria, they had this uh, table and they were trying to encourage people to study. Uh, yeah, they have yeah. a new exchange program in Belgium. Mm-hmm. So I went there and I'm just like, oh, let me uh, let me talk to them. They're like, yo, if you go to Belgium, it, it'll be the same price as you just pay your regular tuition. So it's not going to cost you more. And maybe we can get you a scholarship. So I'm just like, all right, cool. So I applied, applied for a scholarship. They gave me a scholarship. So now I have to decide. If I go to Belgium, second semester, it means I got to quit basketball. Definitely. And basketball at this point had been like, Like I said, part of my identity. Mm, You know mm, what I'm saying? mm. But now I'm coming back from Japan with this new mentality Mm. of, okay, I want to be different. I'm going to do different things in life. I'm going to redefine who I am. So I had to make that decision, and I decided to quit basketball. Uh, And then I went to Belgium uh, to study second semester. And then that in and of itself, that's when I first got to finally got out of Tennessee Mm. was when I went to Belgium. And then that being there uh, was two things that were important in my life. One was it got me interested in cooking. Yeah, yeah. And two, it was at that point where I was like, yo, I'm done with the US. Like, I'm, there's so much of the world I need to see. And that's kind of what set me on the path. Next year I studied in Australia. Then I graduated, moved to Japan. After I lived in Japan, I went to Spain for a bit. Then I got my master's in Amsterdam. Then after Amsterdam, I came here. You know what I'm saying? Like, after the, it was that point that sent me on a path of not living in the US and then at the same time also cooking and also got me interested in DJing as well. I was like at the parties I would always handle the music. I didn't have CDJs. I just had the CD player. So yeah. like I was doing the old play a song, yeah. take the CD out, put another yeah, CD quick, in. Quick play, yeah, quick yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was doing that cuz I didn't I didn't know anything about DJing, but that's kind of where the interest started and then 3 years later I got my first turntable. So that that trip to Belgium was like one of the most uh impactful um moments in my life. But it also stemmed from what we were talking about earlier, which was my desire to get out of Tennessee. So I don't know if I tied it all together. I think you did, 100%. I think I also have a new string to tie to the story. Because I think you find your love for cooking in the way that you illustrated your dad cooking for you guys, Mm. right? Because I can only imagine it's Belgium, which to some extent is slightly worse than the US in terms of diversity, right? Mm. So I'm sure now Japanese stores are even like rare, 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 rare. So you end up being forced to learn how to cook, even if it's not something you originally intended to do. And in that you develop a love, so it becomes like father and son. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you another thing, and it's gonna be a little bit more shallow, but it's the truth. (laughs) <laughs> when I was there, yeah, um, I was living. Uh, there I had these two Italian friends, okay, uh, Fabio and Antonello, okay, and um, they they were pretty good cooks, okay, and they used to invite me over to their building for dinners, and they would cook. And they'd always have the flyest tons come through ah. for dinner, <laughs> and I'm just like, damn. This makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. This makes sense. I need yeah, to learn yeah, how yeah. to cook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So, uh, and also I like to eat good. So, you know, and then I'd start going over there, hanging out, watching how they were doing stuff, you know? Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and then eventually I started learning how to cook. And I was like, that. this is a good way of being social and just having people over. And this is also became part of the... Um, getting to the point where I started throwing my own events, my own parties, stuff like that. So when I went back to the U.S., my cooking game at that point was up. I was cooking for people, having people over. And then I was also in a uh, fraternity. Uh, and I, I ran for a social chair, which means I would throw all the parties. And that all kind of stemmed from that that situation, you know. And then from the cooking there, I just started learning more and more about it. And then um, then I had an Italian girlfriend who put me on game, man. Mm. She put me on game. Yo, she could cook. And... Um, what she taught me is so much about was like uh, a lot of the basics, um, working your seasonings, um, a lot of different things like that. And mm. I hung out with her a lot. Every time she would cook, I'd watch everything that she mm-hmm. was doing. And then um, that was kind of like the next step, you know. I think that's super interesting. Mm. Um, and in the spirit of socializing, I think a cocktail always does the trick. No doubt. So production has made us paloma as that's, per your request uh, that's what's up i'm not sure how it tastes though so it's a uh, first experience for me as well mm. but in terms of your kind of educational history your educational background the narrative amongst creatives yeah is school's not going well for me mm-hmm. i need to find something else and 
and my uncle has a pair of CDJs at home and he is the DJ in the community. So let me become a DJ. Yeah. But you have an extensive educational background. Right. Is that something you'd recommend? So to say that, listen, go to school, pursue education. Yeah. And then once that's done, and once you've given yourself the opportunity to explore that, go and perhaps explore the creative industry. Yeah. Or would you say, if you back yourself? Yeah. You know, it's difficult to say. So what I would say is the first. Um, so I look at it two ways for myself. Mm. So one, first and foremost, what I'm going to say is education is never going to hurt you. It's never bad for you. You know what I'm saying? It's like exercise. You know what I'm saying? It's the more education you get, it's never going to be bad for you. The only thing that it can maybe do is stall your progression in terms of maybe something else that you're going to do. But I look at all the things that like being at university taught me it taught me like now so much of what we do from a business point of view is writing proposals doing presentations mm. uh meeting uh with whatever you know different high level brand managers all these types of things who are all got you know people that are university educated so for me it's you know i've written two theses i wrote an undergrad thesis on economic rise of china and i wrote a, a master's thesis on uh political integration of terrorist groups so like i can write you know mm. so it's and I've presented in, in uh, all of these um, present the, these these uh, theses, so it's there's a certain level of confidence that I have going into all of these things. Mm. So I feel confident, and mm. I feel that I'm better prepared uh, for a lot of the the business situations that that I come across. So I think that that's and also. When you go to university, you're taught deadlines, um, you know, Discipline, yeah, all these other things that are, yeah, that are necessary. Soft and I think, skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of artists today, um, you know, for me, one of the things I always say is that um, talent is great. But for me, if, if you have talent and work ethic, dope. you have a good chance of winning. Mm -hmm. But for me, when I'm looking to work with someone, if I've got to choose one or the other, I'll take work, work ethic, ethic over talent because there's so many talented people, you know, mm -hmm. who just talent is not enough to talent isn't enough to get make you succeed. Work ethic, you will succeed mm -hmm. at something. Eventually you'll succeed at something, you know. Even if if you're a creative or let's say you're a, a rapper or something like that, if you have strong work ethic, you might not succeed as a rapper, but you'll succeed as something. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, uh for me work ethic is more important. So I I I do see the value of education. Um but then I also look at myself. I'm like, "All right, cool. Had I chased a more creative path and started DJing at 21 instead of at 26, 27, or like really getting into it full time at 29, where would I be now? You know, but you know, at the same time, like the process is the process. And you gotta um, it. Yeah. Um, so what I would say is if you have that creative element and you want to be a DJ, then go to university, um, and be that student DJ, you know what I'm saying? I don't even know if Stones still exists, but yeah. like DJ at Stones while yeah. you're, a, you know, while you're a DJ, I mean, while you're, you're getting your degree or something like that. Because again, if you look at how many DJs are making a real living, I mean, South Africa got, has a lot of DJs, a lot. like thousands and thousands of DJs. And if you look at who's making a living, it's maybe 15% of them, you know, mm. who's making a good living, who owns a house, who owns their car who has savings that's like two percent mm. so the odds of you being a successful dj in a competitive place like south africa that has so many good djs is not that high so it's good to have and something to fall back on you know what i'm saying mm. like you could be the local dj at you know whatever bars that you're playing at and making enough just to survive but how long you can do you do one? that for 100 you know what i'm saying do you want to be one of the top guys or do you just want to make a just get by and if you want to be one of the top guys man that's like the top two percent mm. so i would say get the education um and then also pursue the creative on the side 100%. And, and at the end whatever is supposed to happen for you is going to wow. happen if you get off yeah you know and even like i know a lot of people that have good jobs mm. like lawyers and stuff mm. who still dj on the side for who, who have like successful events mm. as well i just i just want to jump in here because um, I want us to really speak and give this segment a lot more time. Mm -hmm. um, but we just need to quickly change our battery packs and then sure. we'll be back for the second interval mm -hmm. where we speak more about what you should pursue and how your life ended up turning out. And we're back. Um, where were we? We were talking about DJing and 
where they should pursue it as a career yeah. Yeah. if you don't have an educational background. Yeah, and talking um, about work ethic and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and talent. Yeah, yeah. So what is it exactly that you went and studied in school? Like, in so school? undergraduate was uh, economics. Okay. Uh, my father's an economics teacher. And then I slid in art history mm -hmm. um, because that was like the creative side. And I couldn't tell my parents just because they're like, it, 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 would, it didn't cost them anything more. Yeah. But at yeah. the same time, my pops would have been like, why are you wasting your time yeah, studying yeah, art? Yeah. You know, so he only found out when I graduated and they they said what diploma I had. So then he's just like, I'm like, it's too late now. Yeah, like, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Uh, and then um, master's was international relations. And at that point, you know, I kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I had spent two years in Japan. I just started DJing uh, that side. And again, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't brought up to believe that uh, that creative industry was an actual career, you know. So uh, my parents kind of put some pressure on me to like go back to school. So I was like, you know what, international relations, you know, work for the UN. I can travel the world, like, you know, let me do that. So I uh, went back to do international relations, and I did that uh, at the University of Amsterdam, which was also an amazing experience. And that also, from a DJing point of view, kind of also took me to, I wouldn't say another level. But I had a, a weekly event that I had. That was my first weekly. Uh, it was every Wednesday. And then uh, I was doing like every res party. Yeah, I was, yeah. you know, it was crazy. So back in those days, you know, it's Amsterdam, so you're on bicycles. Yeah, yeah. So I was still do, DJing on uh, vinyl. So I had to get like the saddlebags. Uh, so I'd have records in like both saddlebags and then like a backpack full of records. And that's how I'd rock up mm -hmm. at every party. So... Yeah, it was it was cool. Like I learned more about DJing and I improved, you know. Yeah, yeah. So let's fast forward a bit. Mm. You touch South African soil. You're yeah. now on in Nzanzi. Mm. What is the first thing you do? Do you decide okay? Um, or, or where are you at this point? Are you kind of established as a DJ and so you just nah, go straight into the scene? Or? I was. Um, so at this point, DJing was still not a viable option. So I came over here to work on a project um, that I got through Bush Radio in Cape Town. So it was a youth development project using hip hop. Uh, this is 2007. I arrived November 2007. So we developed this project that was teaching um, life skills uh, to a couple different schools. Uh, and then the whole process is like, you know, we went there and we teach these like life skills. Then we did this whole mobile recording studio yeah, yeah, and we yeah. got people to like record their own raps or, or, or sing it. And then we did this competition amongst four schools and the winner got like a cash prize. And then mm. we did a donation to the school and then we produced an album. So we put a compilation album together and on that album, this is crazy, like I can show y'all what like we had. So I had a friend of mine from L.A. who I met in Japan. So he got artists from the U.S. to, to be on the album and we and then he helped us, you know, also record uh, artists in South Africa. So the, the album had artists from from both countries. And on that album, we had an artist who was a friend of his, still a friend of his named Breezy Lovejoy. Y'all know who Breezy Lovejoy is? I do not know Breezy Lovejoy. Breezy Lovejoy eventually changed his name to go by Anderson Pack. No so way. we got Anderson Pack on an album yeah. that before he was Anderson Pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this compilation album. So when we brought Anderson Pack out, we collaborated with Afro Punk to bring Anderson Pack out. 2017, when we picked him up at the airport, he's like. It's like Akio, I know you, and I knew that we had kind of worked together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't know if he actually knew me. Yeah, He's yeah, like, yo, yeah. I know you, and then I realized afterwards, you know, obviously we had done that, but that dude was also my friend on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Before yeah. he was, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like that dude used to comment on, yeah, yeah, on yeah, Facebook. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was, it was such a cool moment um, to have him out when he was part of the initial music project that we did in 2007, 2008. So that was kind of the first project. And then at this point, um, 2008, I started a party at a place called The Waiting Room, mm -hmm. uh, which is called Cool Out Lounge. So at this point, it was kind of a downtime in hip hop in, in, in Cape Town. So uh, again, now this goes back to like one of the main, main things that I do in business. And it's like, I never look for what's hot. I look for what's missing, you know? Mm. And hip hop was missing in a sense like just a, there, there was a, a thriving scene in terms of what people people loved hip hop but there was no party in the city you know yeah. all the the hip hop parties outside of like I think it was um, there was a place called Joburg and there was another place um, what's the other spot um, that's still popping it's the only place on Long Street that's going seven days a week how can I not remember um, 
we'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So back then, like, if you wanted to hear hip hop, it was always like a dingy ass spot, bad mm. sound, all of that. So uh, I went to a place called Waiting Room, which is kind of always what I do. I always find places that I want to DJ at, and then I go and I'm just like, yo, I want to DJ here. What do I got to do to throw an event? And Waiting Room was, it's not as run down as, as it is now. It was, it was like a nicer, nicer spot. So um, they were like, okay, cool. Uh, what, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do like a hip hop night first Wednesday of the month. And they're like, yeah, we don't, we don't do hip hop here. Um, so I'm like, all right. They're like, but give us a mix. So I put together this mix that was like all instrumental stuff, like, like hip hop beats, but mostly instrumental stuff. And then I sent it to them. They're like, oh, sh- yo, this is cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then they let me do the party. And then first party we had, it was straight up hip hop. You know, we had an open mic, we had guest rappers, all of that. But it took them a while to realize, it took them like five, six months to realize what it was that I was doing. And then at that point, they tried to get us kicked out. Mm. Um, And they were using all these types of excuses. But at the end of the day, the main reasons we had changed the demographic of that. Of the spot. Of that spot. Yeah. And now it's completely different now. You go there now, it's just black and colored. Like, it's it's crazy, like, how we've changed. And we did the same thing. I'll talk about it later with Kitcheners. We did the exact same thing. So at that point, they were trying to move us out of there to another venue that they had. Uh, but our contact there was just like, yo, man, stick, your, stick to your guns. Refuse to move. He's like, you're, you're doing more numbers than their Friday and Saturday night. If you insist on staying, they'll, they'll let you stay. So we insisted on staying and, and we kept waiting room. Um, so then we started doing that party. It got bigger and bigger. Again, we didn't know how to monetize it. So yeah. we had like one of the dopest hip hop parties and like very impactful uh, in terms of like establishing the culture. But we didn't really know how to monetize it. And then 2009, we started bringing artists from the U.S. Back then, it's crazy to think, you know, the rand to the dollar now is like 19 and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back then, it was six and a half rand to the dollar. No way. Like the rand was so strong. So we started bringing out artists from the U.S., kind of like 90s, early 2000s, like uh, golden era type artists, and then bringing them out. And I started doing shows in Joburg and Cape Town. And then that was kind of my come up uh, in Joburg. So yeah. now I started going back and forth. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of how things kicked off and yeah and then at some point i think 2011 that's when i'm like let me let me do music do this full time mm, mm, you know mm. so how was that initial cuz i'm assuming your corporate to an extent right between 2007 to those 2008 nah we were just three kids who you know we were very Optimistic, you know, we felt like we could make a change in the world. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, now I'm a capitalist. Um, <laughs> but back then, you know, I was, I was like, yeah, we can, we yeah, can change yeah, the world. Yeah, we can yeah. help the kids. Um, now I want to help the kids, but in a different way. But you know, I think that after we did the first run of projects, and we thought that they were really successful, uh, now we had to get funding to do it again. So we went to all the organizations, we went to all the big corporations, put in our proposal. We had like. Um, all the results mm. you know we felt mm. that our project was was successful compared mm. to the other like youth development projects that were going on in cape town and we just couldn't get any funding you know we tried everything yeah. USAID, everything um and i think that was kind of at a point where i realized like three kids trying to go to these corporates these big um foundations and stuff like they're not going to respect us uh, and they didn't uh it was all about kind of who you knew mm-hmm. um so at that point i moved more into um private sector because like I, th- I think i understand um back then we thought that if we went to a big foundation that had money that uh, focuses on youth development we said yo here's a project that works we thought we'd get the money but it doesn't really work like that it's like again who you know while what we do now with events we have a sponsor let's say it's an alcohol sponsor because alcohol sponsors all the parties you know yeah, what i'm saying yeah, yeah. we know what they want yeah they want alcohol sales and they want ex- uh, brand exposure like it's it's a it's the transaction is yes, much more yes, simple yes, 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 yes. you know um so you know i kind of moved into that and things started getting bigger you know I, I always say it's kind of luck but i don't know if it's luck or or you know the universe working in your favor but it was as we were building this hip-hop brand that's when Hip hop started picking up in yes, South Africa, yes, and yeah. right when, uh, so I always say, the modern golden era of South African hip hop started with AKA's Victory Lap. Mm. For me, that was the moment where South African hip hop turned that corner and became commercially viable and changed where everybody 
kind of got into hip hop. That's when, you know, so, uh, you know, we were fortunate that Cool Out was doing well at the time. So all of a sudden, all the other brands had to incorporate hip hop. And who did they go to? You know, there weren't a lot of people. There was obviously Slicker. There was Teebs. There was uh, Hip Hop Scholar. Um, there was Dimples, you know, and then there was us. So we, we managed to move into the corporate space. Yeah. 2011, 2012. But at that point, I didn't have any experience mm. in the corporate space. But I did. But I was educated. You know, damn! I think that that's super cool. And now I think you are in a unique position, right? Mm. Because you say in the '90s you're seeing the birth of hip hop in America, right, yeah. right in front of your eyes. And now in the 2010s, going onwards, you're seeing the rebirth of hip hop. Yeah, in it was beautiful. South Africa. Would you say that the 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 South African sound almost sounds borrowed and as a result Absolutely. diluted? Or would you say it was borrowed, yes, but it was grown to fit the South African palette and it was molded and shaped and beaten I, to become South African and South African? I think it depends, you know. I think you got different artists. You got, mm. um, you know, I used to, to, to manage and DJ for an artist named Reason, you know, and his style was, was very American. Mm-hmm. Um, even AKA, to a certain extent, his first um, couple albums were... were, were very American in terms of his cadence, you know, like a lot of the stuff that he was doing. And then I think also when Trap came in, a lot of people were kind of copying that. But then I think at some point you got much more South African influenced hip hop. But, you know, I, for me, I remember that it always used to be this argument, like the anti hip hop people in South yeah. Africa would be like, oh, you guys are just trying to copy American sounds. You're trying to sound American, um, this and that. But for me, the way I look at it is that an artist should always express themselves in the way that's most comfortable. Uh, to them so if the way that they if they prefer to rap in english they must rap in english you can't make a rapper who's more comfortable in english rap in vernac more any more than you can make a a vernac rapper rap in english English, you know what i'm saying so i think that you're either good or you're not whether you rap in english or vernac like to me that doesn't matter you're either dope or you're not dope um and i think that that was you know you had certain artists that were really able to to mix i think like with casper for example Mm. you know i felt like he was really good at taking whatever was hot in, in, in America and making a South African version of it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? He yeah. was really good at like transforming it and making a, a, a localized version of whatever the biggest song was. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that a lot of it was borrowed, but at the same time, it's like the same thing with like what the Nigerians and what the Americans or even the Europeans are doing with Ama Piano now. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's they're they're taking it and trying to make their own kind of versions of it. But at the end of the day, it's still, I don't know, going to sound very South African, but like you're going to jump on what's hot, whatever's yeah, trending. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. So moving on from 2011, what are you doing? Are you still in the event space? Um, mm-hmm. And, if so, I suppose now you're a bit more seasoned, a bit more mature within yeah. the industry and you're discovering your sound. What does that look like for you? So, you know, we, we were with hip hop. Um, and again, this goes back to me. I'm always looking for what's what's missing. Yeah. So yeah. then at some point, hip hop blew up and it became so commercial. And Cool Out was never like a commercial hip hop brand. So right around 2016, you know, that's kind of when 2015, that's when Future Beats kind of started popping like the selection type stuff Mm -hmm. so we kind of started a new brand called alchemy at that point which was very like future bass future beats bass soundcloud music type stuff uh so we even did like a festival during that time where we brought out uh, an artist named tom mish uh because he was a soundcloud guy before he blew up so we kind of started focusing on kind of alternative stuff Mm -hmm. and that was also when we got into um so we want to focus on more alternative sounds so that's under that alchemy brand we did tom mish we did uh mick jenkins we did um uh sir from top dog entertainment uh and we did anderson pack and then that was kind of like where i started seeing the gaps and and, and seeing the value in like an r&b yeah. uh, movement so we w- continue to do events you know and i think right around 2000 the, the uh, evolution of me as a individual was i think 2016 or 2017 is when I uh, kind of retired from management. So uh, at that time, I was managing uh, Reason, uh, Loot Love. Uh, I was assisting with uh, Ginger, Ginger Trill. And at that point, I think I sent them all an email being like, all right, cool. Thank you for everything. But um, I'm, in, I'm, in one month, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm done. So uh, that's when I decided 
everything that I'm going to do uh, in terms of like that type of stuff I'm going to do for myself. Yeah. Because also I'm getting a little bit older, so I'm like, you know, if I'm going to make it as an artist, if I'm going to make it as a DJ, it's it's now or never, you know. And then I was kind of seeing what I was doing for all these other um, these other artists, and also you know I had a couple people in my ear yeah. who were saying. Yo, man, you can do this for yourself. Like, why don't you focus on your own career? Like, all the stuff that you're doing for them, you can do it. And I was, you know, struggling to have that belief in myself. I think that a lot of people uh, struggle to have that belief in themselves. You know, they call it imposter syndrome. So, um, you know, it took some some pushing from people that were close to me for me to be like, all right, let me just take all my chips and then bet them on myself. 100%. You know, and then that's kind of what I did. So, 2017 to 2019. I was just focusing on DJing, so I was doing hip hop and Afro beats. I was like, let me invest in Europe, so I was doing my tours in Europe, I was doing stuff in the States, uh, and then I was just starting to do more stuff in Africa. So mm. I picked up a gig in um, Ivory Coast, I was doing some stuff in Angola, that's when I started going to Tanzania. So you know, everything that I was looking at was how can I make myself different? All right, cool, everybody's focusing on, on Joburg, cool, let me, let me, let me, let me you know, uh, introduce myself to new territories. You know, so let me let me see what's up in uh, in Ivory Coast. Let me see what's up in Dar es Salaam. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? Let me see where I can make an impact. So uh, it was right around that time that I started focusing on myself, and then from there, Strictly Soul came afterwards. I think that's that's super interesting, and I'm we're going to definitely chat the nitty gritties mm. of making a successful event curation space. But you exist in the hip hop space, right? right. And hip hop thrives off the idea of beef. Right. And earlier in the interview, you spoke about your friend checking a white boy. Yeah. So can you fight? And if you have, yeah. how did that go down? Um, I, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah I, th- I mean, I think I can fight. Yeah, like, it's yeah, been a while. Yeah. since so, like, I haven't got my ass whooped in. It's been a while, man, since I got my ass whooped. But I also try not to get in fights. Yeah. The thing is, because I've been in so many fights, like growing up, like, I know how bad it can get. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, you can be, I see, you can be scarred for life. Like, mm. you can get... All types of fucked up. So I try to avoid it, but at the same time, I'm not, you know, you ready know, to yeah. go. We ready yeah. to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I think in terms of beef, I, I, you know, I've always been like a chip on my shoulder type person. You know, that's, I think what, what drives me, I'm very self-motivated, but the one thing, if you want to make sure that I'm going to do something, just tell me I can't do it. Yeah. Then yeah. it's guaranteed. Yeah. Yo, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to have blinders on to just focus on whatever raw, you know, to, to, to accomplish that. So I think that like whenever we've had, you know, we haven't had beasts, but we've had rivalries, you know, I, we, we had a rivalry. I, I wasn't like, I mean, even with say pop bottles, you know, I mean, Dimples and, and Shake and VG, they were our peers, but they were the commercial brand. We were the underground brand. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, it wasn't beef, but I think you know, they wanted to do better than us and they definitely did because they, under, I think they understood the commercial market better, yeah. but we also had our lane and we did well, you know, um, there's a, there's a lot of other, uh, brands that, you know, event brands that were kind of in the same, um, uh, uh, uh lane as us that we weren't necessarily, we don't want them to do bad. My whole thing is I don't want anybody to do bad. Like, let's say me and you do are doing the same thing. I'm not like, I want you to, to fail. I just want to do better. So if, if you do well, I'm, that's just going to drive me to do better. So, you know, it's like a lot of times, like with competitive people and DJs, people don't want to put on DJs that they think, if you have a brand, let's say you have an R&B party. Mm-hmm. I got an R&B party. Some people like won't book you because they're like, yo, I'm not going to put him on because he's going to come to my party and like yeah, 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 outshine yeah. me or whatever. Me, I'm like, yo, I'm going to put him on because he's got a big R&B party. So he's, he's in the lane. But if he has a dope set, Yo, I'm just gonna get on and be like, yo, I gotta beat that set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not in a way that it's just you've put the bar here, so now I've got to take it yeah, higher. You know what I'm saying? Of course. Yeah, and it also just is better for everybody. So I think like um, there were, you know, I think I was much quicker to go to war um, in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. You know, we we definitely had a bit more, you know, back competitive battles with other brands, but now it's like. Not not so much, you know. I, I do see with, um, again, we started uh, Strictly Soul in 2020. Back then, again, we did it because no, there, was, there wasn't an R&B party that was lit. Now, in the last year, like, every time I look on social media, there's a new R&B party. Yeah. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. New R&B party. So our, my thing is just like, okay, cool. Like, we're going to show why 
we're the biggest one on the continent. You know, we're gonna, it, it's gonna drive me to do, to, to be better and better and better, to push myself more and more and more. So I think that that's, <clears throat> you know, my thing. It's like, it's never a competition, but if you bring the competition to me, then I'm like, let's make it a competition. Yeah, you know? yeah, like, yeah. So I don't look for it, but sometimes I, I do want it. You know, one, one thing will drive me for, a, you know, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, even now, I mean, I can talk about it. Like, I was trying to get on the Boys to Men show, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and I was pushing for it for six months, contacting the promoter, yo, let me get on, let me get on, let me get on. And I don't campaign for things usually, but I was campaigning for this. Um, and I know the guy, you know, and then after six months, he's like, nah, no, we chose somebody else. And I told him, I was like, yo, I'm not going to be mad. Like, I, I take no's really well. And I think that's one of the biggest things, advice I can, I can tell you in the industry, accept a no. Like a no is one of the best things that you can get because a no prevents you from wasting your time further. Mm, mm. You know what I'm saying? And then you can even ask them why they said no and that's an opportunity for you to improve to yourself. Learn, yeah, you know? So me, like, for example, Afropunk, they hit me up like, you know, can you submit, uh, you know, you're in consideration. They didn't choose me in like the two or three years. So I was never like, fuck Afropunk. I was always like, okay, cool. You know what? Maybe I'm not big enough. I'm going to work so hard this year that Afropunk can't deny me next year. That's the way I look at it. I don't look at it as like, fuck them. I look at it as like, oh, all right, all right cool. I'm gonna work so hard that you can't deny me. And I think that was the same thing with the Boys to Men show. I was like, I was like damn, man, I, I really felt like I deserved it. Um, but you know what? Thank you for the motivation. And that not being on that show is gonna motivate me for the next year, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I'm gonna wake up and be like, yo, man, these guys didn't rate you or they didn't, you know, they picked someone else over you. Let, um, show them why you are who you are you know it's like in the um i watch in the nba i'm very like again like sports motivated and sports like i look at sports uh um examples and you'll see something like uh they had this guy tyrese halliburton who's doing really well right now uh and they had, did an interview with him and he was picked i think 11th in the mm -hmm. draft and they're like yo can you name all the people that were picked above you and he named every single person and what team they went to you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like that's the same type of mentality i have where i'm just like all right cool didn't pick me. Let me let me prove myself even more. Yeah. I so I think I, I try not to do the beefs, but I, I do like that motivation. Mm. I do like getting looked over. I do like being denied. I do like it when people count me out or when people say that I can't do something because that's what pushes me. Otherwise, if it's just success, if it's just strictly soul winning, you know, and no one's talking shit or no one's trying to compete with us, we become complacent. You know, like, I think that's something that I tell my team all the time, too, is that they've been part of this team since we've been winning since, say, they came on board 2021. I'm like, y'all are just used to winning. Mm. Like, you don't understand what it's Rock. like to lose. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, we haven't had two bad events in a row, three bad events in a row where we lose the money or like now someone else is bigger. Like, let's not wait for that to happen. Let's we got to stay motivated on our own, you know. So I think like taking taking L's, uh, you can't win forever. So I, I, I welcome uh losses I, I welcome times when i play at an event and i have a bad set because that's that's where you learn that's where you like that's where you improve if you keep winning you like you become complacent mm -hmm. um i think i want you to chat to us a bit more then and to motivate us mm -hmm. and the chefs out there what are some of the biggest parties that you've played at i was reading some article that said mm -hmm. that you played a lauren hill after party vibe yeah. and you got scolded for I did. playing music or swear words and you had to yeah, that one hurts. and yeah. you know like just talk to us about those kinds of experiences man there's been a lot of like really great events um, you know I would say so there were times when I was uh, when I was DJing and managing Reason we did some amazing things we toured with Kendrick Lamar when he was here we did the three city tour which was like the first time being part of like a major tour you know mm -hmm. like the buses and every city and dancers and all that stuff that was that was pretty dope uh, we opened for J. Cole which was also amazing mm -hmm. um, opened for Nas when he did the Castle Lights you know I was a huge Nas fan growing up uh, Lauren Hill was cool so I did like her private party afterwards yeah. so that story is like I was playing uh, the Lauren Hill um, private like autograph session, mm. and so I'm just like, "Yo, it's Lauren Hill. I'm gonna play some hip hop, yeah. whatever." So uh, I'm playing hip hop, and at some point, her um, assistant comes through, and her assistant's older. You know, it's like she probably looks like she's like 55, yeah, yeah, 60. Yeah. You know, an older woman. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like yeah. you, you got to respect. You know, the elders. You know, so she comes over, and she's like, uh, "Miss Hill." She, so everybody's got to call her Miss Hill. Yeah, like. Miss Hill would please like to request that you play music without so much cursing. Yeah, yeah. 
And I'm just like, damn, Miss Hill, Lauren Hill just told me to change up my music. And as I'm, she's telling me this, it's Drake, zero to 100. So she's literally telling me to play music without cursing. Mm. And Drake is like, fuck being on some real shit. That, you know, I go zero to 100, real, you know, yeah. just cursing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As she's telling me to stop playing music with cursing. So now I'm shook. You know, I'm shook. I'm like, yo, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So then I just switch into like a, an old school Kwaito set mm. for like 15 minutes until I can figure it I'm like, yo, they, I don't know if they're cussing or not, but Lauren Hill definitely does not know if they're cussing. <laughs> yeah. So then I switched into that and then I could figure, then I figured out the direction I was going to go. And then I like steadied the ship. Yeah. And then afterwards, Lauren came up and was like, okay, yeah, cool. Really enjoyed your set. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. like, all right, cool. I was, but I was also just, I was definitely shook. Uh, that was really cool uh, to do because I was a big Lauren Hill fan growing up. Um, I think Daisy's 2019 was dope for me. Um, they had me closing out the selection stage, so I had the last set uh, on that stage, uh, and it was one of my best sets. Uh, Everyday People obviously is a is a big one. Um, there's there's been some amazing you know uh, parties that I played at. I played uh, this thing called Soul Fest, mm -hmm. um, and I think also 2019, which was TLC. Uh, Drew Hill and SWV. So again, just in that R&B lane. And I was a big TLC fan um, growing up, so it was amazing to meet them. And uh, with Drew Hill, I just wanted to see Cisco do a one-handed cartwheel, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he delivered. So I was, <laughs> I was really happy about that. But that was cool. SWV, I was a fan of too. So, mm. you know, I think that um, there's been a lot of like milestones in terms of performing for people uh, that that I looked up to growing up. I think one of the the moments where I, so I always tell people, you know, there's moments where you do things you dream about and then there's moments where you, you're like, yo, I didn't even dream about this. And I think one of those moments was um, when I was doing something for NBA Africa when they came and they're like, yo, we got a special guest DJ or something like that. So the DJ that played after me is this guy named Cedric Sabalas. Uh, he was a former NBA player and now he's a DJ. And I was like a kid kid mm. when uh, I saw him. He won the slam dunk competition. I think in the 90s. I'm not really sure. But he won by like doing a blindfolded dunk. Yeah. But I was a kid when I watched him do that. So, you know, at that point, you know, the NBA and like entertainment is so far removed from my life. And then now to DJ with him, mm. you know, as an adult, I'm just like, yo, I saw this dude win the slam dunk competition uh, when I was a kid. And I was just like, I couldn't have even dreamed of this. 100%. This is just beyond anything that I could have ever comprehended. Yeah. You know, I say with like opening up for Nas, like, yeah, it's something you dream of touring with Kendrick Lamar like I felt like we earned it mm. you know but DJ with Cedric Sabalas I'm just like yeah what is this life you know mm, mm, I think that's beautiful in the last minute mm. I want you to nominate one person um because you've given us the ingredients you told yeah. us it's about work ethic it's about consistency and self-motivation yeah also are... doing not what's hot yes but what's yes, missing what's that's the one of the most important things I can 100%. say and then just another thing is just being authentic and that's yeah. one of the things that changed for me as yeah. well is that i tried to when i realized i'm not going to be anybody what, except myself which is everything you know uh, the uh self-doubt anxiety liking weird shit um you know being an ambivert like all these other types of things there's going to be so many people that relate to you and i look at a lot of artists and they struggle to build a fan base and i know them and i'm, I'm thinking to myself i'm like you can't get anybody to relate to you. You can't get fans to relate to you because you're not being authentic. How can, how can you get someone to relate to you if you're not even being yourself? Yeah. You know, yeah. so I say, like, look for what's missing and, and be yourself. You know, the people that are the, the artists that I see that are the, the most successful are people that are distinctively themselves. And people are like, yo, I see myself in them. You know, that's how you build a fan base. Mm. Uh, please just nominate one person for us that you think should definitely come on the show and share their recipe for success. Ooh. Um, how about like Boogie, Boogie, my boy. She's a stylist. Okay. I did a lot of work with her. What I like about her is, I mean, she's also a good friend. It's also, I want to give you somebody different outside of like 100%. music, but she's someone who also stayed in her lane mm. you know what i'm saying yeah. built it up from just like doing like small pop-ups at uh, uh uh at pop bottles having her own clothing store doing like uh styling for music videos just for her friends uh to now doing major corporate work 
mm. I think she'd be a dope person to have on. Definitely gonna reach out to her. Word. Akio, thank you so much for making time. I appreciate You've it. You've given Thanks us fire, me. fire ingredients. Uh, shout out for coming. To thank you, thank you for, for the success. meal. It was of dope. Course. Uh, of course. Yeah, we didn't get to chat about it on air, but I really enjoyed it. And you did a, a very good representation of one of thank my you. favorite dishes, katsudon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Chefs, they have it.